James Archer to come down and talk today. There are some designers where you look at the work they do and you kind of want to kick yourself for not having thought of it first. <laughs> and James and his team, they're the kind of designers that everything they do, I have that thought afterwards. They are just an amazing branding company. Um, thanks to Kareem for, for letting him come on down here for the day. And I'm going to go ahead and give you your full time because I can't wait to see what you're All right, thank you very about. much. All right, guys, I want to start by, well, thanks. I want to start by telling a story about remote controls. So I went on Amazon and I tried to find the best rated remote control, to, just to see what it was, because I had a hunch if it was the best rated one, it was going to have to be pretty, pretty sharply designed, and it didn't disappoint. So this is a, an amazingly designed remote control. So think, of, think for a minute about the context that you're in as you're using a remote control. So you're probably in a dark room. You're probably holding it like this and not even looking at what you're doing. And if you do the wrong thing, it's just gonna ruin your whole evening. You know, you're trying to turn up the volume and you change the channel and you can't rewind because you change, like it's just gonna mess everything up. So this one, when they designed it, they kind of took all that stuff into context. So what they've, what they've done, if you look at the buttons, you see different areas of buttons. They're shaped different ways. They're oriented different ways. You know, even the, the volume and channel buttons are kind of pointed different directions. So just by feeling, you kind of know which one you're on. So you can really quickly learn to use this remote control and, and figure out how to do it in the dark without looking and, and kind of know what you're doing and not, not make mistakes that are going to ruin your evening. So I don't have one of those, but I do have one of these. <laughs> So this is the Cyber Home DVD remote, the, probably the cheapest remote possible for the cheapest DVD player ever made. And it is infuriatingly difficult to use because even if you have all the lights on, even if you're staring at it, you can still barely figure out how to use it and you will almost certainly hit the wrong button. So this was designed without a lot of empathy for the situation that people are in. And so from my perspective, design really is empathy. You know, if you think about what designers do, it's fundamentally to empathize with the user that is going to be dealing with whatever the solution is and actually doing something with it and, and creating something that's going to work for them. So when, when people fail to empathize with the user, as we saw with that last remote, it's, it's always going to fail. And when you succeed in empathizing with the user, you will succeed with the design. So those two are, are inextricably correlated they're basically the same thing. I mean, I think you could, if designers had the job title of empathizer, it would still basically be the same thing. So I want to give you another example. So a few months ago, I worked on a, a project with a software company in Atlanta, and they have this huge enterprise level software solution, um, essentially for running supply chain. This particular piece was for running a warehouse. And this isn't the actual screen. This whole thing was under NDA. It was all top secret and stuff. So I can't really show you too much. But it was a screen that looked a whole lot like that one. So use your imagination. And the context for this was picture, picture a warehouse. So you know, warehouse, you order for something from Amazon. You've got runners. They run over here and they get this product. And they run over here and get that product. And they run over here and get that product. And they put them all together in a box for you. And then they ship it down the conveyor line. And some guy right, you know, toward the, the loading dock has to check that box, make sure everything's the way it's supposed to be, and do what's called closing the box. It may not be physically closing the box, but it's sort of symbolically closing the box and says, yes, this is the box, put it on the truck. So that transaction, of course, they have to record in the software. So what they have to do is he's got, a, he's got an RF gun scanner, and so he scans the label on the box, and then he has to go to his computer and kind of check and make sure this is the right one. So when they asked me to come in and start, start working on this, you know, b being the empathizing kind of guy that I am, I started asking all kinds of questions that they thought were really dopey, like, who's usually doing this job? You know, how do they feel? Who's their boss? What kind of, what kind of situation are they in? Are they standing? Are they sitting? How much are they moving around? You know, what's, what's their day like? How many hours are they working? Things like that. And, you know, the, the whole time, you know, and, and that conversation probably wasn't more than 15 minutes or so, because we were just trying to blast through some stuff. But that whole time, they're kind of thinking like, this is, this is great, can you just design the screen? Can you make this screen better? And they're, and they're trying to convert it over to a web format, and they're like, can you just webify the screen? And I kind of explained like, no, we gotta we got go through this process, just trust me. So one of the things that came out of that interview was we, I found out that you know, they're over here, and say this is the conveyor belt, and they're over here scanning, and then their computer's like three feet away typically. And so they have to walk over here, 
check the number on the computer. Okay, it's right. Walk back over here, scan the next one. So the thing that had never occurred to them, and I can't, I can't show the whole redesign, just, but just a relevant piece of it, was to make the print bigger. They never thought of it because that's not how you design software. You just have fields and all the fields are the same size and you just stack the fields up in a way that makes sense. And so I said, well, why don't we just make that bigger so they don't have to walk over there? And that's, that's a little thing, but by empathizing with the person actually doing the job and thinking through the context, think of how that person's job just got exponentially better. And if this is just one design feature in this huge enterprise suite and they have other design features of that level of thinking, think of how much easier it's gonna be for them to sell that software. You know, that, that, that reduces, you know, injuries of walking back and forth and you know workers comp claims and like all, all kinds of things and all, all we did was make the text bigger so that those are the kind of design solutions you can come up with if you're actually empathizing with the user which is a step that surprisingly many designers forget it just gets left out of the process so one of the things i want to emphasize is design is a process it's not a skill set and this sounds kind of contradictory to say but design's not about the people it's not about the designers it's about the design process what makes a good designer is someone who understands that process and rigorously follows it. Not necessarily someone who knows all the tips and knows all the Photoshop shortcuts and knows all those things. It's that you understand the process and you rigorously follow it. So we'll talk a little bit about what that process is. The first step is the one that usually gets cut out the first, which is actually studying the situation that you're in and figuring out what needs to happen. So Ideally, this is user research. You can do ethnographic research and actually watch users in their natural context using the software. There are you know, digital metrics that you can, you can observe, you can track things. There's mountains of data that you can use for this. But you guys know sometimes you don't get that, right? Sometimes you don't, you don't even get access to any users and you have to just kind of make your best guess based on the situation. Well, in that case, you know, I'm, I'm designing enterprise level software for a publicly traded software company. And all I had for that solution was 15 minutes of talking to the people within the company who were subject matter experts. But that was better than skipping it. Even that, you can extract a whole lot of insight if you, if you sort of rigorously follow the process and you know what kind of information you're going after and you just dig into it. So the next step then is to actually empathize and to figure out what is it, what is it like to be the user? You know, it's one thing to know that your user is, you know, has, has 2.5 kids and they this and they that, you have data about them, but you have to translate that into what is it actually like? And so when I was thinking through that design, I made myself walk back and forth just as that person would and think about what it would take to make their lives better. And the solution was a simple one, but it, it took that empathizing and me getting inside their head and understanding what it was like to be that person to come up with that solution. And then you prototype. You start coming up with solutions and test them to see if they work. Um, you know, that, that particular design went through a couple of iterations before we settled on the one that we liked. Um, but those iterations all took place in the period of about one hour. So I would design something up and say, is this, is this close? Does this kind of meet the needs? I'd, I'd walk the client through it. They'd say, well, there's this problem with it, and really they're going to be this. And so I'd move things around. So that prototyping, again, we don't always get all the time for prototyping that we wish we had. I mean, in a perfect world, we've got six months of user testing and we can, we can make all these revision stuff. That doesn't always happen. But even a little bit of prototyping can, can help out a lot. And then, of course, you guys can probably guess the last part of this, which is complete the cycle and do it again and again and again. So once you have something, study it again, you know, test the prototype, see what happens. And maybe that's not phase one. Maybe that's phase two. Maybe that's five years out that you actually... Go, come back and have enough data to say, here's how we should revise this. But it should always be cyclical like that. Design is a, a cyclical process. It's not a one-time launch it and you're done kind of thing. So here, I want to tell you another story. So this is a, a client of ours, Bromwell Housewares. Um, and so when they came to us, it was a, it was a Yahoo store. You know, and and their, their basic request was, can you make this look better? <laughs> it, was kind of, it, was under, it was under some new management. They, they said, hey, you got, you got to help us out. Sales are really low. Can you make this look better? And you know, my, my response as it typically is, is that's not actually your problem. So if you, if you look at here and you start, you start reading through this, you realize this company was founded in 1819. That's a long time ago. <laughs> this, is, this company is almost 200 years old that it, it's, it's been in business. It's one of the oldest still surviving American companies. And they've got this incredible story behind the founder. So I mean, the, when the founder was born, the United States looked like this. This is still Spain, I think. 
And, it, and his father was in the wire weaving business. So wire weaving, you know, at the time, this is pre-plastics, pre-manufacturing. They had to make, make things out of what they could. And a lot of things were made out of wire. They would take wire and create things out of it that they could use for, for different purposes. Um, so he, he came from an entrepreneurial family, you know, just after the nation was formed. I mean, this is a great American entrepreneurial story. He fought in the War of 1812, which is basically the continuation of the Revolutionary War. Um, and in uh, 1819, he, he floated down the Ohio River to Cincinnati to set up shop for his own. He left his dad's business, took some supplies and some machinery, went down to set up his own thing on the frontier because at the time, Cincinnati was the frontier. So, you know, this, this, is, this is like the most classic all-American story you can think of in, in terms of entrepreneurship and the American dream. Um, he got there just in time for the Panic of 1819, which was, you know, at the time, the, the nation's first and worst financial crisis. So he's basically trying to start this business in the middle of a depression. And he manages to do it. He manages to create a really successful business, grows the company, um, you know, creating things like hand-cranked flour sifters and tin cups that were, you know, they're used by the U.S. military. Um, and, and he really succeeded. I mean, he grew this business to the point where there are thousands of employees, a catalog of thousands of products. They were known, they were respected, they were trusted. This is a great company. Have you guys ever heard of it? Nobody's ever heard of this. Because when they came to us, all they had was this Yahoo store. Like, that's what the whole thing had devolved down into was it was a, it was a skeleton crew staff, a, you know, a handful of products that they were still making on, on the original equipment, which is, which is great. But, you know, if you just try and sell the products themselves, I mean, we're, we're talking about a $30 cheese grater. You know, it's not a robot cheese grater, it's just a regular cheese grater. Now, there's a story behind it, and what they were trying to convey was, these products have story behind them, they, they, it's this great piece of Americana, but this website's not selling that. So we kind of dug in and said, that your actual problem is that nobody cares. It's not that the website doesn't look good, it's not that it's confusing, because if you, if you really wanted to buy that cheese grater, you'd figure this out. But it was that there wasn't any reason for you to care. So that's what we dug in. That was the actual design problem we started to solve. So we started doing some research into you know, companies of a simpler age to kind of see how they had evolved and also what the, what the design looked like at the time to kind of create that, that sense of realism behind it. You know, we researched the typography and we found modern equivalents for the typefaces that they used at the time. And you know, this was a time when people used lots of typefaces. It wasn't just you know, headline typeface, body typeface like we do now, which is kind of boring. But they, they would have posters that would have 10 different typefaces on it. So we kind of kept, kept that spirit and pulled that forward. We started looking at different ways that we can, we can pull out visual elements that evoke that time and really convey the stuff that's going on. And so as a result, we're able to basically build a brand around it. You know, the company was renamed after the founder, Jacob Romwell, and we, we created this user experience, this customer experience, that's actually relevant. So when you see that, and you see that, and that's his actual signature, we managed to dig up the founder's original signature and use that for the logo, it creates a little more sense of relevance for what's going on. You know, we designed the website. Now this website's a few years ago, it didn't have the cool parallax and background videos and stuff that it would now, but it, it, it was a nice idea that actually conveys what the company's about and, and conveys the spirit of it, most importantly, and tells the story and gives people a reason to care. So, that was the design process. We weren't solving the aesthetic problem, we were solving the actual problem, which was relevance. And that stuff works, man. So I talked to him two years later, we had lunch together, and I said, hey, how's business going? And he said that their, their business had essentially quintupled, and he attributed that pretty much directly to the experience that we had created around the brand. All we had done was given people through design a reason to care about what it was and actually communicate the real story that was going on there. Now there are a lot of different layers to design and the problem is a lot of people never make it through the, the bottom few layers. So the bottom few layers are things like functionality, intuitiveness, these are all good things. And when people talk about UX, they tend to think about things like, you know, let's, how do we make it functional? How do we make it intuitive? And those become the goals. Well, those are, that's just, you're just scratching the surface. Those are table stakes. If you're, if you're not doing at least those, you shouldn't even call yourself a designer. <laughs> then you get into, you know, efficiency. So it's, it's nice, it's functional, it's intuitive. How do we make it so that people can get through the process quickly and easily? So that's kind of, we're getting into the middle zone. Then we get into things like comfort. So that can be physical comfort, like we were talking about walking back and forth to a computer. Or that can be psychological comfort. You know, if you're, if you're on Amazon and you're, you're going through the checkout process and you have to hit continue, you know, there's a little note there that says, you know, your order will not be placed until you have a chance to confirm it, things like that. They give you psychological comfort. Now you can't do that unless you're putting yourself into the head of the person using it and really thinking through what are their concerns and frustrations and kind of digging into that stuff. And then we get to delight. 
And that's, that's really what we were trying to do because that was what was missing from the Yahoo store. There was no delight there. There was no magic. There was no excitement. So you know, to me, that's kind of the hierarchy that you should go through. You have to have the stuff on the bottom, but you should be really working toward and pushing through to get, get to the things on the top. So here's another project we worked on. This is CAPS Research. So this is a supply chain research clearinghouse. They basically give, you know, distribute research and, and organize research for you know, Fortune 500 retail companies to be able to better run their supply chain. So Walmart can get their boxes 15 minutes earlier than they normally would, stuff like that. The most boring stuff you can imagine and the most boring site to accompany it. But the thing that a lot of people don't realize is supply chain is what makes the world go around. Like the reason we have anything that we have is because of supply chain. And if the world is going to be made better, if our standard of living is gonna be made better, it's supply chain that's gonna make that happen. And these little incremental differences, I mean, the fact that Walmart becomes more efficient at doing something or a local bookstore becomes more efficient at doing something so they can compete with Walmart, things like that. All those things are related to supply chain and these guys were at the center of that, gathering the research that, and putting it out there to these, these you know, C-suite officers to explain to them how to do this. But you don't get that from here, do you? I mean, this, is, this presents it as the most boring thing that you have no need at all to pay attention to. So we needed to help, help change it and help make them relevant again. So we actually started doing user research. We started calling chief procurement officers at these Fortune 500 retail companies. And they're surprisingly difficult to get a hold of. But we, did, we, we kept at it until we had enough information that we were really starting to get inside their head and we could build a, a profile around it. And then, you know, based on the, the things we started hearing, the metaphors they were using as describing what they were working on and so on, you know, we, would, we started to build, you know, a concept around this brand. So we'd start using cultural archetypes, you know, the intellectual or the explorer. And so based on these archetypes, we then pull out visual elements and kind of tying all these metaphors together. Our brains work on metaphor. I mean, metaphor is the, the foundational language of the brain. So we started pulling things out. And so when these CPOs are talking about, yeah, we're blazing new paths, we're going into uncharted waters and so on, well, we're pulling out all those metaphors so we can use them back with them and make sure that when we launch this website, it's literally speaking their own language. It's, it's using the same metaphors that they themselves use. So based on those metaphors, we start pulling out possible visual elements. We start working on, you know, even, even the logo. We start figuring out ways that we can, you know, get those metaphors across in the, the logo itself. Um, start coming up with different concepts um, and working on the verbal strategy. I mean, the presentation right, right before this one, I was talking about how, you know, copywriting is design. It absolutely is. It's verbal design. And we, we follow that same approach. We do a whole verbal strategy of this is the kind of voice and tone you should be using. These are the kinds of keywords you should be using. These are the kinds of keywords you should be avoiding because the, the content of the website, the copywriting is a fundamental part of the design process. And so going through a process like that, that's how we turn something like this into a site that looks more like this. Now, this, this is an aesthetically pretty site, it's all right, but the more important part is the, the subconscious stuff that's happening. Those are the right colors for this target audience. Those are the right words for this target audience. And it just reaches out and grabs them and pulls them in, and they suddenly see this organization in a totally different light than they were seeing them before. And they, you know, they, they said even internally within the organization, it transformed how they thought about themselves. It changed their internal culture just going through this branding and website process. Um, and and they, you know, in working with the people that they were working with, I mean, they said their pitches have never gone better. As soon as they were in there, people were making decisions almost before they got through the pitch. Um, so it's, it, it just kind of goes to show, I mean, if, when you empathize, when you get inside the head of the people that you're talking to, that's what enables you to get really effective, really powerful design. It's not just about aesthetics. It's about understanding the psychological piece. Design's fundamentally working with the psychology of people, not just their eyes. So this is a, a kind of a simple one. So this is Athlinks.com. It's the world's largest database of endurance race results. So if you've ever run in a marathon or anything like that, you're almost certainly in this database. So it's one of those things where you can go and you can find your race results and you can see your whole profile and it'll show your whole, whole history in there. And the founder himself was, was an endurance runner. He's a pretty, pretty diligent one, kind of a tough, tough macho kind of guy. And you, you kind of see that character come out in this website. So it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a masculine, dominating, endurance, tough guy kind of, kind of color scheme and the way it's laid out. But the, the, the problem is the target audience for runners isn't, isn't him. The CEO was not representative of the overall target audience, which includes a lot of women. It includes a lot of people doing it for social reasons. It includes a, a, a very diverse group of people, not just, you know, kind of tough, endurance-oriented, macho sort of guys. 
And so when we redesigned it, we kind of took that into account. And, and we, had to, we had to kind of coach him through this process a little bit and talk him through, you know, hey, I know that you need to like this website, but we're not designing this website for you. We're designing it for these people over here. So whether you like it or not, it's not that relevant to your business. This is what actually matters over here. And that, you know, that takes a little coaching and stuff, but he got there, he's a super smart guy. Um, and, and so we, we steered the website a little bit. So it's, maybe, you know, it's a little more on the feminine side. It's a little less intimidating. It's a little less performance oriented, a little more social oriented. And you see that through the photography, you see that through the color schemes, and even, even just the language that's used throughout the site. And, and this can be done even on a low budget. So this, this was a, a client that came, so we've had a, a kind of a home security and commercial security client locally for a long time. And we, we love those guys. We've worked with them for so long and we have to just have a close trusting relationship. And one day the fire chief came to the CEO and said, you know, I wish I had something like this. And he described this thing where you, you take the, because what happens during a fire, after a fire, it, you know, the firemen put it out. Well, it can relight, you know, there could still be embers in there. It could still catch. So they have to leave someone behind to sit around and watch the fire and make, or watch the, you know, the burning rubble or the, the put out rubble and just make sure it doesn't catch again. And that's not a great use of resources. So he, you know, he started asking around. It turns out police have the same thing. So I mean, if you're if you're doing a stakeout or you know, if you, you know, even on construction sites, they have to have remote security things, and so people aren't trespassing on the site. And, and so we put together this package. It's just a single case that you open it up. It has everything you need in it, and it's all tied to online. And you can you know go online. And you can see the cameras and everything. So it's a kind of a quick deployment security system. So what we had to do, they, they didn't have a big budget for this. This was kind of a skunk works project of theirs. And they said, well, just help, help us however you can. And so we came up with this website, but you know, we, we really put extra emphasis, not into you know, coming up with cool scrolling effects, not into ultra fast web hosting. Everything was rudimentary, but we went through the empathy process and we started doing a lot of research into what are, what are fire chiefs dealing with in this situation? What are the, the police chiefs dealing with in this situation? And, and very carefully choosing copy and imagery that speaks directly to them. So this is, these, these, each of these pages was just stupid simple from a design perspective, but they were highly effective. They resonated with the people who needed to see them and it got the point across. So you can do this stuff on a really tight budget. This is another project we worked on. I love this design, this is great. <laughs> Um, so this is 80stees.com. Um, the, the founder started this while he was still in college. And you know, he started making up some shirts for himself. His friends liked them. They wanted to get some. And the next thing he knows, he's got a t-shirt business. Well, by the time they came to us, they were doing about $10 million a year in t-shirts with this website. Um, but the catch was nobody knew who they were because all their business was coming through PPC and, and you know, online marketing campaigns. And so you'd see an ad. You're like, oh, that's interesting. You click on it. You go over here. Maybe you buy the product. Maybe you don't. But then you forget about it. And meanwhile, they were getting you know, beat up by companies like Threadless and Busted Tees that have communities and have people who remember who they are and they actually, they've actually built a brand. So they wanted us to kind of help do that and help steer the language a little bit more to appeal to people because people don't buy these t-shirts because they need a t-shirt. They buy these t-shirts because of memories and nostalgia and you know, it's, it's like a tribe of people that they want to affiliate with and say, oh, you, you watched Airwolf? I watched Airwolf too. So, <laughs> So we kind of, we, we reshape the brand based around that kind of experience. And so we, we just put a ton of work into the copywriting and to, to make sure that we were evoking the right things, using the right kind of language. And this has definitely been one of the most fun projects we've ever had to work on because the kind of research we have to do is I'll walk in and find our copywriter like sitting watching old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cartoons, like looking for the right language to use and making sure he understands everything. Now this one was a, uh, a kiosk at the mall. So these are in Walmarts or in Home Depot. So this is a, you know, you have to get your key copy. There's a, like a vending machine where you can go and get that done. If you walk into a Walmart, you'll probably see one right in the, the entryway or pretty near there. So they, they had built this and it was working pretty well, but they were having a lot of user interface issues with the, the actual system, the touchscreen system that you interact with. And so, you know, we kind of went in, did an audit with it. And you know, the thing is, if you think about the context that you're in there, you know, you're in the entryway for a Walmart. There's other vending machines beeping and blooping around you. And there's, you know, there's that air blower thing that happens every time someone opens the door. It's loud and there's people going back and forth and your kid's running out the door while you're trying to get this thing done. But you know, more importantly, think about the situations where you might need to get your keys copied. You just bought a new house. 
You just kicked your boyfriend out and changed the lock. Like, there, like any situation where you're getting your keys copied, you're already stressed out. You're already in a high anxiety situation. And the system just wasn't accounting for that. I mean, if you look over here, you know, the, even, even just their use of the color red, you know, there were frustrating bits of the interface, but even just their color usage, they're using the most frustrating, anxiety inducing color to do that. And then, you know, in kind of classic engineer fashion, you know, if there's a situation that doesn't work out, what do you do? You throw an error and you tell the user they did something wrong. You know, if, if, if it was a key that the, the kiosk couldn't produce, they, they would throw this big red screen down on the bottom and just have this huge error message that looks like you're just a horrible person because you even tried to do this. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're in this stressful situation. You, you've probably got a kid on your arm and one kid running out the door and all these things happening around you. And so we, we tried to really get inside the head of that person and figure out how can we just take this down a notch? How can we just kill the anxiety in this situation? So we basically redesigned the interface to have almost no error messages at all. So there's almost nothing you can do that makes you feel like you've done something wrong. All the language, all the imagery, everything is kind of steered around just nudging them back onto the path that they need to be on, being a little more understanding, a little more apologetic, and helping that person through that process. So th you know, that's, that's a simple thing, but to do that, you have to get out of that mindset of, well, these variables didn't line up, therefore throw an error. You know, it's, 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 a, it's not the user's fault. You know, whatever the system does, it's not the user's fault. They've got a key, they want a copy of it, the rest of it's up to the kiosk. So, you know, we, we kind of took that approach and that philosophy while going through and doing this. And, you know, it's really because, like I said, design is empathy. That's the, f that's the core of everything about design is empathy for the user and, and a lot of people forget this, empathy for the client. Because this is how we talk about our clients, you guys. <laughs> like, this is, this is horrible. This, this disgusts me. So, but this, these are the kind of things that here, you know, I'll go to, I'll go to a design event, I'll go to a developer event, and it's just people like, like just griping about their horrible clients. Guys, the clients are not horrible, they're awesome. They pay us to do what we love to do, and it is a privilege for us to be able to do that. And you know, the thing is, to do that, you have to have empathy for the clients too, not just the users. You don't, you don't love your users and hate your clients. You love your users and you love your clients, and you're trying to make the whole system work. Because your clients are dealing with a whole lot of stuff. And the fact that you want the logo a little bit smaller and they think maybe it should be a little bit bigger, that's just one of 10 million things that they're dealing with right now and they don't necessarily want to hear your whole lecture on the whole thing. Doesn't mean you should cave into them, but have a little empathy for the situation that they're in. They're dealing with a lot of stuff, you're one small piece of it, and they've got, they're trying to sort it out as best they can with little information and little knowledge. And you know how, how do you feel if your doctor treated you the way we as an industry treat our clients and they have that kind of attitude, you know? Do you, do you wanna leave your doctor's office feeling like your doctor's just turning over and going, man, that patient was so stupid. I can't believe they thought that, you know, obviously they did that. And you, you, you know, meanwhile, you, when you go to a doctor, I mean, you're in a super vulnerable position. You're afraid, you're worried, something's going wrong with you, you don't know what it is, you're taking your best guess, you went on WebMD and you looked something up and now you think you have lupus <laughs> and you know, you saw something on house and you're pretty sure that's you. And, <laughs> And you know, but really, you don't want you don't want your doctor to, to treat you like crap because of that, right? You're doing the best you can. So you want the doctor who actually has some empathy for the situation you're in and says, "Listen, it's okay. It's not lupus. I know what you read on WebMD." <laughs> and, and and to really understand and appreciate that, and to kind of calm you down, give you the information you need, help you make an intelligent decision, and move on. And ultimately, the decision's still yours as the patient. But you know, that, that doctor's gotta kinda coach you through it and help you fill in the gaps that you don't have. That's the situation we're in with, with our clients. And that doesn't mean be two-faced about it. It doesn't mean smile to your clients, say, oh, I understand, and then go out to the bar with your friends later and just say, man, my clients are so stupid. Because if you, if you feel that way, you're failing to have empathy for the situation that they're in and the problem that you're even trying to solve. And if you don't have empathy for the situation they're in, you can't really be an effective designer. You just can't do it. And because design is empathy. That's fundamentally what it's about. So if you are going to be an effective designer, you have to have empathy for your clients. You have to understand and appreciate the situation that they are in and the constraints that they are up against and the budgets that they're dealing with and their boss that's yelling at them for something and, and find the best solution you can. And maybe you don't get to use the font you want to use and maybe you don't get to use the cool feature that only costs $10,000 more. And you think that's totally reasonable, but they can't come up with the $10,000 because, uh, stupid clients. Well, guess what? That's the constraint. You have a box, design within the box, do the absolute best you can within that box, 
And maybe, you know, maybe sometime later they come back for revisions. Maybe sometime later there's some other thing. Because they remember you as the person who solved their problem, who understood their needs, who got it done within the constraints that had to happen. And so when those constraints expand and they can do more, you're the one they come back to for that. So again, it, it kind of comes down to this process. I mean, study the situation, empathize with the users, empathize with the client, and prototype things out and go through. And if you stick to this process, guys, the process works. You don't have to be an expert designer. Like I was saying earlier, I mean, the, um, the, you don't have to have the job title of designer to be an effective designer. You just have to follow this process. If you do this, you will come out with effective design. It may not be stuff that wins you know, aesthetic awards, but it's gonna work. And I've seen that over and over and over again. I've, you know, we can take students and put them through this process and they start coming up with brilliant works. I can take developers and put them through this process and they start coming up with brilliant design work. So the process works. So I wanna give you one, one last example of that. So this is Ferdinand Porsche. In 1931, he started a car company in Germany. Um, they didn't start manufacturing cars, but he was a designer. He was sort of a consultant who would br be brought in to kind of help out with, with designing cars. It was still a relatively new industry at the time. Now, at this time period in Germany, this was a really rough economic period. I mean, they were going through a you know, bad recession. There was like 30% unemployment. Everyone's struggling. All the families are, are trying to figure out how to get by. Not a lot of people with money going out buying new cars. You know, most, most families didn't even have enough money to buy a motorcycle, let alone a car. So in the middle of all this economic turmoil and all these things that are going on, Germany elects a new chancellor. You might know him. <laughs> and so one of his directives was, okay, we've got to come up with a car because Americans are driving cars all over the place. And our, you know, our lives are awesome over there because we got cars and freeways and all this kind of stuff. And he's got to get Germany to catch up. And so he, he puts out this challenge basically and says, we need to design a car that can go you know, more than 60, 65 miles an hour it's got to be able to take two parents and three kids and, and get them up to that speed, and the whole thing has to cost less than a motorcycle. That's a pretty difficult challenge for a car designer. You know, you're not used to dealing with those kind of constraints. And I, I'm guessing, you know, the, a, lot, a lot of people started participating in it and trying to come up with designs, Ferdinand Porsche uh, among them, and I'm guessing he was feeling like, man, this is impossible. Like, these constraints are ridiculous. I can't do this. Nobody can do this. But he kept at it and he followed the design process and he, he empathized with the users and tried to figure out what they need, what the situation was gonna be, how is this gonna work. He started prototyping, prototypes didn't work, you learn from them, you come up with new prototypes and eventually he comes up with this working prototype for a vehicle that would cost less than a motorcycle or cost about the same as a motorcycle and be highly effective. And it would, it would meet those constraints. And the thing was, he did such a good job of this that this car was in production for 65 years. So picture, a, picture a, you know, say a Honda Civic today still being in production in what, 2079? In basically the same form that it is today. That's how well he solved that problem. And you know, he, he did this under just amazing constraints that he was dealing with. So you know, he, he, he built the world's most successful automobile, made it the price of a motorcycle, and, and his client was literally Adolf Hitler. <laughs> So the design process works, and I know that you guys, you, you guys all have frustrations with your clients, <laughs> and you all have budget constraints. We all do. That's just the job. But we can work it out if we remember that you know design is fundamentally about empathy, and we you know if if you stick to that core principle, everything else will start to fall into place, and it'll all magically work out. I'm James Archer. Uh, I'd love to talk to you guys. Feel free to email me or tweet me. I'm, I'm happy to respond. I love talking about this stuff. I work for 40, which is a design firm based in Phoenix. Um, we, we've been around for about 11 years now. We do primarily user experience design and, and customer experience design like we've been talking about. And we are very proud to now be part of the unstoppable juggernaut that is crowd favorite. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have.